I used to live uh, below a modeling agency. Um, for 19 years, I lived in a 1920s high rise in the Central West End overlooking Forest Park. And the top floor of that for a number of years, what had once been the like double, triple height ballroom looking out over the city, had been turned into a modeling agency. And so it created some very awkward, um, what I call elevator moments. Uh, elevator moment is when I'm kind of still half in my pajamas going down to get my mail and getting back on the elevator and a, you know, six foot four, you know, Swedish looking model is there and she's got heels on that high and her waist is that big around. Seriously, I don't know how she does it. I mean, she must not eat a grape a week. And she's got, you know, the angular features and she's just, and I was just like, hi. And then what was really awkward for me is when the male models would get on and they'd be like seven feet tall and they'd have this like, I don't know if you know what a mandibular angle is, but it's this angle right here. They'd have mandibular angles that are like this, you know, they'd have cheeks jutting out. They'd have these big broad shoulders and these narrow waists that are like triangles with feet. And, and I'd just be like, hi. And then I'd get off the elevator and just think, I, I need to join a gym. Because what they were doing is they were presenting an image of physical perfection. And with me, it was like looking at myself in the mirror thinking, I do not measure up. And when God presents his perfections, his law, his desire, his heart of love and what love looks like, what is love for God and love for neighbor, when he presents that, whether you're talking about the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law, whether you're talking about Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, whether you're talking about Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 telling us what love looks like, or in Galatians telling us what it looks like to be bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Every time God lays out his standard, his law, his heart, his, his, his will, it's like showing a mirror and saying, oh, look at this. And it should show us how we don't measure up. And if you have Jesus, that's a liberating thing because what it's doing is it's pointing you to Jesus, the Savior who only came to call sinners. We're reading through St. Paul's letter to the Romans. And we're in the first half of chapter 7. We've been reading through and he's talked in chapter 6 about the call to live as, as those who have been freed from the dominion of sin, to live out that new identity. And now he turns slightly and he says this. This is verse 1. Do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to men who know the law, that the law, that's God's law, has authority over a man only as long as he lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he's alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. So then if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's released from that law and is not an adulteress even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we're controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I wouldn't have known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire, for apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, Sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. Because sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment put me to death. So then, 
The law is holy. The commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. What do we see here? First, we see this human problem we have that we kind of just want to disobey God apart from his grace. Um, This side of the fall, human beings are still image bearers, but that image has been fractured. That image has been damaged. And so we don't image God very well. Instead, we have uh, what Paul here describes as a sinful nature, indwelling sin, flesh. He talks about the sinful passions that were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. He speaks here of the sinful nature. Image bearers, but not what we were intended to be in the beginning. When our first parents divorced God and said we're going our own way, we all are now born outside the garden with the weight of sin and sinful natures. None of us is born innocent. I remember one, one pastor talking about how he went to a church and and he was going to do a baptism, and they had a little white rose out, and he said, what's the white rose for? And he said, it represents the child's innocence before God, and he says, then what am I baptizing it for? Because yeah. we're all born dirty, with sinful natures. The flip side of, of the reality of being image bearers this side of the fall is that we're greatly damaged by it, and So we have what Paul here calls sinful passions and a sinful nature at work inside of us. And this side of the fall, even just knowing what God wants will tempt us. Um, That's what Paul's talking about when he's talking about coveting. You know, I wouldn't have known what coveting was if the law hadn't said don't covet, but sin seized that opportunity and and, and produced in me every kind of covetous desire the opportunity that came from knowing. It's sort of like the forbidden fruit thing. You know, if, if you, know, you may have a small child who will never, ever, ever think to do a headstand on your living room coffee table unless you tell them what? Do not do a headstand on the living room table. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to be in the ER and they're going to have a next frame. You know, it, it's just the nature of the beast. We, we want to be independent. And... and So it ends up that the commandment itself brings death, not because it was designed to, but because there's something defective in us. Sin seizing the opportunity deceived me, he says. This side of the fall, just knowing what God wants can get us in trouble. And this means that apart from God's grace, apart from his divine intervention, um, humanity is is not free in its moral agency we're in bondage to sin. Uh, we're still moral agents, but, but our souls are enslaved. And that's the language that Paul uses consistently in this letter, to be slaves of sin, where we have to, where we have to do what it says unless God intervenes. Um, it's the language of being bound or in bondage. He says we were controlled by the sinful nature. That means we didn't really have much agency. The sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies. We bore fruit for death. You know, we're actually controlled, apart from God's grace, we're controlled by our sinful desires. It's strong language. Uh, you know, to be controlled by our, our sinful nature, our passions, our longings, our desires, our wants. And, and, and some would even argue, I think fairly convincingly, that in fact we kind of always do what we want most. Um, because we are creatures... Of, uh, of the heart and our actions only flow from what's inside the heart. Um, for example, when you, when you entered this sanctuary, you chose to sit down in a specific seat. And some would argue that you could not have chosen to sit elsewhere because you chose the seat at that moment that you most wanted. It may be that you came in and you do not want people looking at you, so you chose the seat as far back as you could get. It may be that you really want to impress the pastors, and so you chose the front row. It may be that you thought you would probably have to get up during the worship service, so you chose an aisle seat. It might have been that you knew you wouldn't have to get up uh, during the service, so you chose to move in to allow other people who might need an aisle seat to have an aisle seat. It may be that you really wanted to sit 
in the front row, left side, right at the edge, um, and except there was some selfish pastor already sitting in the seat that you most wanted, and so you didn't do what you want, but actually you did. Because you wanted to sit there, but you wanted even more not to eject the pastor from that seat. And so you did what you wanted. You did what you wanted most. We are creatures of desires. You may have other desires that are higher than others. And so you might want to sit in back by nature, but you see somebody sitting alone that you care about, and so you move further front to sit with them. But we're always navigating the fact that we want things and what we want most is what we're going to live for. It's what's going to drive our decision making. Um, the point is this, no matter how many conflicting desires you may have experienced, you chose the seat you wanted most at that moment given the circumstances. And that's what we do. Your desire is always there and the greatest desire is what's likely to, to win out. And that is wherein lies our bondage to sin if there's not a greater desire at play. Uh, it's not just, you know, that I, I get to choose whatever I most want given the circumstances, it's that I have to. I will invariably do whatever I most want given the circumstances at that moment. We're creatures of desire and we have little control over our hearts. He says we were controlled by the sinful nature. He says the sinful nature bound us. Picture yourself, you know, hands and manacles, legs tied together, you know, like literally like a Warner Brothers cartoon getting thrown onto a railroad. You know, you, you can't do anything about it. You're bound. How do we change what we want? How do we change what we desire? I may try to gain some level of behavior modification by leveraging one desire against another desire. Uh, for example, if I feel like telling lies is really going to advance me in life, but I'm also a horrible people pleaser. I might use my people pleasing to stop telling lies because I'll know that people will get disappointed when I find out that I'm a filthy liar. And so in that case, it's, it's one desire putting another in check for the sake of behavior modification, but none of that is going to make me love Jesus. None of that is going to make me want God, to want to see his face, to want to know him, to want to please him. Uh, none of it's going to make me love him. It's just behavior modification by checking one desire with another in order to live for myself more effectively. Uh, for example, you may be afraid of God's judgment and that might make you stop cheating on your spouse, but will it make you desire God? Can it make you want him? A desire to, to be with him and to see his face and to win his praise. Uh, how can we actually change what we want if we're in bondage to our sinful nature and our passions? How can we change our desires? How can we break our bondage when our humanity is, is enslaved, it's bound? Uh, the problem is we, we want to disobey God's instruction because we're rebels from birth, and we push against God, and we may try to get from God something we really want, but how can we change such that God is actually what we want most? So that what I want is my heavenly Father and everything else is negotiable. What is it that has to happen to get us there, to change our most greatest longing, our most fundamental desire? And the solution Paul points us to is a new and better spouse. A marriage, not to God's commandment, but to God himself in the person of Jesus. Divorcing the former, setting us up for a marriage to the latter, or more precisely, having the former die so that we get Jesus instead. Paul writes, do you not know that the law has authority only as long as a man is alive, but you died to the law through the body of Christ so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, to Jesus. Belonging to Jesus is a better spouse instead of belonging to his commandments as a performance treadmill. Jesus brings a new freedom from bondage to sin. By dying to what once bound us, Paul writes, we have been released from the law. We have been released from the law so that we serve in a new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Have you, have you, did you read that? You have been released. What once bound us no longer binds us 
but instead points us to Jesus, wherein we have a new way of living in obedience to God through the Holy Spirit. You know, we humans, we're vessels. I mean, let's face it, you all, everybody in this room probably knows what it's like to be swept off your feet by something, someone, or, or some promise, or some hope at some point in your life. We all know what that feels like, unless, well, even small children understand what, you know, the, the cotton candy stand at the zoo looks like and smells like, or, or the funnel cake, or the frozen custard, or the hot dogs, or whatever it is. I don't want to make all of you hungry, not for anything other than God. Um. <laughs> we're vessels we can never be empty our hearts will be filled with something some longing some desire and so god rather than taking away our sinful desires when we turn to him in repentance instead he adds a different desire a, a desire by the holy spirit that displaces the other desires you know, what, some, of you, some of you are science people. Um, I don't need a show of hands. Um, science person calling. Um, they know I'm talking about them. But some of you are science people. And you think if you had all the best equipment and the best lab at a major research university and somebody asked you, what is the most effective way to remove all the air from a beaker of, of, of air? What's the most effective way to get all of the air out of that beaker? And you're thinking, what kind of vacuum, what kind of, you know, reinforcement would you need to vacuum all the air out without the glass shattering? And you think, oh, that's no. The, it's simple, actually. The easiest way to get all the air out of a beaker is to do what? Fill it with water. It's simple, really. And that's how God goes about changing us. He doesn't vacuum all the air out. He fills us with water. The old desires don't go away. They may get weaker, they, they, or they may come back with a counterattack you were not expecting, but they don't ever really completely go away. They're still in there somewhere, but God fills us up with something denser, something greater, a greater desire, a greater affection by reconciling us to himself through the death of Jesus. And that's how Jesus brings about freedom from bondage, by loving us and rescuing us and sacrificing himself for us and creating a divorce with the thing that once was there and instead filling us up with his presence, with his person, through his Holy Spirit. It's how he gives us freedom by giving us a greater love, a greater desire, a love that can push back on all those lesser demands that no longer bind you. And so having Jesus as a new and better spouse brings about a new and better freedom from our bondage to sin. And that's because having a new spouse fosters a new love, a new love for Jesus. Um, and that changes us. You know, it, it's how this works. You know, you all know the world of romance. If your partner turns to you and says, I command you to love me, what's that going to do? I have to take a phone call, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> no, love me does not elicit love. I love you elicits love. And that's what God gives. He takes away the power of the love me and instead gives I love you in Jesus. Having a new spouse in Jesus fosters a new love for him. You know, some of you have looked your entire life for somebody who would love you for your sake and not just because of what they can do for you. And here in Jesus, you have found him. You have found him who gave his life to gain the one thing he wanted most, which is you. How does this work? Where does God's law then come in? God's law comes in as our teacher. Uh, God uses his commands to show us our need for Jesus, to show us how we don't measure up so that the good news is then good news and not another demand. Uh, this is what theologians call the pedagogical use of God's law, the law as our teacher, our pedagogue, our in instructor. It's not a bad thing. Without it, Paul says, he wouldn't have even known he needed a savior. He wouldn't have known he was a sinner. He says, I didn't know what coveting was until God said, do not covet. And then I realized there's covetousness all over the place in my heart. God's love, his commandments were never intended to be a vehicle for self-salvation through a life of faithful obedience. 
We couldn't do that in a million years. They were never designed to do that. But rather, God's instruction is there to show us not only what it looks like when it's right in relating to God rightly and relating to others and ourselves rightly, but, but also to show us how we don't do that. And the solution is not to give a better set of instructions because those instructions show us we failed. 0.02% F minus. I mean, really bad. You know, the law's not sin, but it shows us how much we need Jesus. It sh- it's like a mirror. You know, I remember a famous evangelist in the, probably around 1900 um, talked about going up to a street urchin and the kid's face is just completely black with like coal dust and dirt and everything. He says, you need to go wash your face. And the kid comes back five minutes later and his black face is now dark charcoal gray with some splotchy peach and black blotches on it. Um, kind of like a Jackson Pollock, only with just dark tones. And, and he, he didn't say that, that's me. Uh, and so uh, he then pulls out a mirror and gets down on the child's level and says, look in this mirror, look, look at this. And the kid sees, and he sees he needs washing, and that what he thought was washing wasn't deep enough. And then he goes back and washes properly. The law of God is a mirror. It shows us we need washing. It shows us we need cleansing. It shows us we need transformation beyond that. It's what it does for us, and it should make us utterly disgusted by our sin. You know, it's the language Paul uses here, and Paul Paul uses, he says, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. You know, we should be able to look at our sin and, and not feel crushed by it because we're not bearing it anymore. Jesus bears it if you're a Christian. But, but to look at it and be disgusted by it, that's part of why God gives us, gives us his law, so that it would become utterly sinful in our hearts and our eyes, that we would realize, you know, without that, without meditating on God's law, we, 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 lose, che- we, we lose our understanding of God's heart, and we can become complacent in thinking that our disobedience to God is not a big deal, as if we're not breaking covenant with our Father, as if he didn't care how we live our lives, as if he, you know, as if God's law has, has no purpose in our lives. But it does. It has a pedagogical purpose to show us, to teach us how desperately we need Jesus and, and how continually we need Jesus and to keep clinging on to him because we keep seeing that we need it and we keep seeing Jesus show up. It's our teacher. And that lesson is one of the things that sets us up to turn to our new spouse, Jesus because it shows us our need. A better spouse, uh, a, a, a better desire, Jesus who can do what the commandments apart from him could never do. When Jesus comes crashing into your life, you know, to develop a relationship with you, when he captures your heart as a new and better spouse, when you realize how much he loves you, then the things that used to captivate your heart, they're still there, but they're not as powerful. Look at Jesus. He's your friend. He loves you. He gave up everything to gain you. You know, how many of you have been out either in the desert or on a distant island or rainforest or someplace where there is absolutely no natural light whatsoever on a clear night and you look up in the sky and what do you see? Stars. Not dozens of stars. Not hundreds of stars. Hundreds of thousands of stars that are there all the time. And you can see them. And they're beautiful. But you know what? The stars are always out. They're out right now. You can't see them right now. Why? Because there is a brighter light in the sky. And compared to that light, those are not even noticeable. Friends, Jesus has risen, the son of righteousness. And when you see him and have his light, it will weaken the allure of all those other things that want to try to control you. Look at Jesus. He's always there. Professor uh, Thomas Chalmers of of St. Andrews University in Scotland, or Scotland, uh, became a Christian in in 1810. And the funny thing is he had already been ordained as a pastor and was leading a church when he realized that he was not even a Christian and, and repented and turned to Jesus and received salvation. And at his death in 1847, one estimate is that half the population of Edinburgh was at his funeral. 
um, very powerful ministry, and one message was called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And in The Expulsive Power of a New Affection, Chalmers suggests that there are really two ways that we might go about changing our hearts to turn from sin. One way is to show us the ugliness of sin so that we become so disgusted by our sin that we forsake it. And, and there is a role in the Christian life of that. We just talked about that. But, he reasons, that approach alone will never change us really to free us up to love God for God's sake. For real spiritual change to overtake us, our sinful affections or desires must encounter something more beautiful, something more compelling, something even more desirable than that. Only a greater affection, a new affection, can expel a lesser, older one. And so rather than trying to pump out our sinful desires and fe with fear and self-will and pride, only the introduction of a greater desire can do it. Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to do what I command. Okay, so how do we then love Jesus? How do we grow in our hearts a love for Jesus if that's the secret to obeying his command? Well, Jesus says, he who is forgiven much loves much. It's the counterintuitive economics of the gospel if you want to obey Jesus, you have to first love him more than you love your own sin. And in order to love Jesus that much, you need a deeper experience of his grace. Because, you know, the Pharisee loved Jesus this much uh, because he had been forgiven this much. But that prostitute on the floor weeping upon Jesus' feet, washing his feet with her tears, pouring her perfume upon him and crying had been forgiven much. And Jesus says that's why she loves much. It's the counterintuitive economics of the gospel. If you want to obey God, you have to love him. And you can't change your own heart, but you can look to Jesus and be forgiven more and have a deeper experience of both your sin and of his grace, which the deeper you become aware of your sin, the bigger his grace will be. And the bigger it gets, the more that new affection will overwhelm you such that you will be willing to do the hard, sacrificial, Jesus said, cutting your hand off, plucking your eye out kind of obedience that God calls us to as his children. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field that a man found and he covered up. And then he says, from his joy, from his joy, he goes and sells everything he has in order to buy that field. Friends, Jesus is that treasure. And what will make you day in and day out ready to sacrifice everything for that treasure is the joy. The joy that you have from knowing that Jesus is a treasure and he is yours now and forever that heart joy, that effusive, powerful, thoroughly aesthetic delight in God as your treasure is what motivates us to get rid of all we have and to serve the kingdom of God in Christ. The expulsive power of a new affection breaks the power of canceled sin. That new desire makes us willing to do what it takes to trust him. Chalmers writes this, he says, the best way of casting out an impure affection is to admit a pure one, and by the love of what is good to expel the love of what is evil. Thus it is that the freer the, the, freer the gospel, the more sanctifying is the gospel. The more it, it is received as a doctrine of radical grace, the more it will be felt as a doctrine according to godlessness, godliness. This, he says, is one of the secrets of the Christian life. Salvation by grace, he writes. Salvation by free grace. Salvation not of works, but according to the mercy of God. Salvation on such a footing is not more indispensable to the deliverance of our persons from the hand of justice than it is to the deliverance of our hearts from the chill and weight of our sin. And ever does the sinner find within himself so mightily a moral transformation as when under the belief that he is saved by grace alone, he feels constrained thereby to offer his heart a devoted thing and to deny ungodliness. To do any work in the best manner, we should make use of the fittest tools for it. Friends, look at Jesus, because therein you will find a love more beautiful, more compelling, more transformative, a new and greater affection from a new and better spouse who loves you completely. In 1749, a New England pastor 
who was preaching a sermon on 1 Corinthians 13, in which he talked about heaven being a world of love. He wrote, the, he wrote this, God has built heaven for this end to be the place of his glorious presence, and this renders heaven, therefore, a world of love. For God is the fountain of love, as the sun is the fountain of light, and therefore the glorious presence of God in heaven fills heaven with love. As the sun placed in the midst of the visible heavens in a clear day fills the world with light, the apostle tells us that God is love, and therefore seeing he is an infinite being, it flows that he is an infinite fountain of love. Seeing he is an all-sufficient being, it follows that he is a full and overflowing and inexhaustible fountain of love, and in that he is an unchangeable and eternal being. He is an unchangeable and eternal fountain of love. There, even in heaven, dwells the God from whom every stream of holy love, yea, every drop that is or ever was, proceeds. There dwells God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, united as one in infinitely dear and incomprehensible and mutual and eternal love. There dwells God the Father, who is the Father of mercies, and so the Father of love, who so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son to die for it. There dwells Christ, the Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace, and the Prince of Love, who so loved the world that he shed his blood and poured out his soul unto death for all men. There dwells the, the great mediator through whom all the divine love is expressed toward men and by whom the fruits of that love have been purchased and through whom they are communicated and through whom love is imparted to the hearts of all of God's people. There dwells Christ in both his natures, the human and the divine, sitting on the same throne with the Father and there dwells the Holy Spirit, the spirit of divine love in whom the very essence of God who is love as it were flows out and is breathed forth in love and by whose immediate influence all holy love is shed abroad in the hearts of all the saints on earth and in heaven. There in heaven, this infinite fountain of love, this eternal three-in-one is set open without any obstacle to hinder access to it as it flows forever. There this glorious God is manifested and shines forth in full glory in beams of love. And there this glorious fountain forever flows forth in streams, yea, in rivers of love and delight. And these rivers swell as it were to an ocean of love in which the souls of the ransom may bathe with the sweetest enjoyment and their hearts, as it were, be deluged with love forever. Friends, look at God as he gives himself to you in Jesus. For heaven is a world of love, and that love can cast out whatever darkness you're facing. Let's pray.